having had various telephone conversations with you as you've been writing and as we've been planning for this evening, um, some of the things I've heard about the challenges that you've been encountering as, as you've grappled with writing these pieces or developing these scenarios. And it would just be great to hear from one or two of you. I find this, the idea of talk, write, even thinking about climate change and writing about climate change is kind of terrifying. And I write very, I suppose, small scale stuff. I'm very interested in personal relationships and this, this, the kind of the scale at which I write and the scale of climate change felt quite kind of divorced from each other. So for me, it was about trying to find the sort of human stories and a way to, to kind of look at the sort of personal dilemmas around climate change, I guess. I suppose trying to, to free myself from the, from the idea that I was writing this big heavy stuff about this very important thing that terrified me was, was a real challenge as a writer to try and to honour it but also get away from it so I could kind of find a creative voice. One of the writers who was at the Weatherfront's gathering, Jay Griffiths, quoted Emily Dickinson and she said, tell the truth but tell it slant. So don't directly go into it because actually then you can diminish it. It's kind of writing propaganda, but not what, wanting to write propaganda. Because I came at this with a completely biased view. I knew exactly what I thought about it. Um, and that's the, that's the great thing about fiction, is you're not writing a, an academic um, summary of something and, and trying to be balanced. You have a point to make, and um, you can use language to do that. You very distinctly felt the anger coming through in your writing, through the, the use of... Yeah, but I think of it's, language and the corruption really of language. To, to have anger, but be have a sense of humour as well. Yes. Otherwise, yeah. it's just um, it's just more people shouting. <laughs> One of the things that came up as we worked on the, the weather stations project was we've talked to a lot of quite a few scientists from different backgrounds, and um, what I found most interesting was with some of them there was an attitude that well look we've given you the evidence what more do you want. Um, and the first question I asked, because I, I'm absolutely no expert on this, the first question I asked everybody who I thought was more expert than me was if I didn't have the knowledge to understand, if I couldn't grasp the concept and the, the consequences of what's going to happen, how do you, how, why should I care? What, you know, what, why should I care? And part of that gap, of the, the way it showed with the scientists that we met was well, if you're, if you're selfish about it, if you want to be selfish about it, we can, you know. And it was almost like, because you didn't understand, then therefore you were, you were selfish because you weren't reaching out, you weren't trying to find out for yourself. Um, and I think that's, that's where storytelling has to come in because you have to go to the people. Um, you have to go and, and kind of translate almost, you have to be an interpreter. And one of the things that defines children's writing as opposed to other types of writing is, you are by definition not writing for somebody like you. You're writing for somebody who is like every other human on the planet, but they have less experience and less perspective. Um, they're going to have lower language levels, so you have to go that extra bit to, to meet. Because with any type of reading, the reader has to come to you. Pa reading is not passive, it's active. They have to do some of the work. What we all, we're all challenged with here is we're, we're taking what um, the experts know and saying, right, how do we bridge that gap? How do we get to the point where it becomes emotionally compelling rather than trying to explain packet-based evidence. And Selina and, and, and Sai and Zina, how did you work on that, you know, collectively as a group? Well, the starting point was the conference itself, which raised a lot of um, discussion between us. We also um, initially were here with another poet, Dorothea Smart, so it, it began just by us getting together and, and uh, just talking over one of the breaks and um, looking at who was in the room, who wasn't in the room, and, and that idea of going to the people, looking at... Um, you know, some of the stories that, that maybe weren't in, in the conference and looking at uh, other cultures and even a questioning of science and, and, you know, what is science, what is art and, and uh, looking at maybe some of the, the cultures around the world which, which rely on folk science and, and how valid that is. So they were our questions from a starting point. In, in terms of working together, like putting what we did together today, um, we were looking at uh, the idea, playing with the idea of performance lectures um, so to be able to have the slides going and have some sort of factual text prose going through it as well, um, as well as like adding a poetic slant to it, was to was to kind of, um, I guess, to make it digestible in, in many levels. You guys were talking about it being such climate issues being such a big thing, whereas we look at um, we were trying to look at it on a very local level um, with ve with this 
specificity of it having been, been actually racialized culturally as well, um, what that means politically, dealing with issues around um, uh, uh, being oppressed and oppressed peoples, basically. So that's kind of like our entry point. And, and Zina, you, you work a lot with young people, don't you, on these issues, and which you know interrelated on, on social justice, climate justice, and as does Asheen. And it'd just be interesting to hear you just say a few words about working with that um, age group. So it's about listening to young voices and, and how they engage with the world that we know today. We see it completely differently to how they do. <clears throat> and so sometimes I feel there's a lot of um, complaints about young people being apathetic. But I sometimes think, well, are they just overwhelmed because they're human beings? They're attacked from so many different sides about what they are supposed to be or not supposed to be. Um, so we could provide them a space with Shake. We provide them a space to just click, push all that noise out and just be. And let's see what voice you have going on inside you that you would like to share with us or you would like to even share with yourself. It's about them having a relationship with themselves as well, a healthy one. The voice is there, which just quiet or drowned out. So mm. it's just for an opportunity, it's a safe space for them to just be. Thank you. I'm now going to open up to the audience. And one thing that in really interests me is that why there's not more and more high profile uh, of this. This is a fantastic project, but considering the scale of the problem and the, uh, the, the amount of response to it, uh, it's massively disproportionately low, but you're the people that are actually doing the communication. So what drew you to it and why, did, why do you think there's that gap? This has opened up a lot of conversations for me with other people that I might not have had those conversations before. For me, I think this, is, this has enabled me to make a jump from not really thinking about it or writing about it to it being part of what I'm talking about in, in my general practice, so rather than turning into climate change fiction, which was one of the things I struggled with. And for me, it was that it felt too big, and this has allowed me to make it to, to start somewhere. I think the language that we use is, is really, um, I think, is a big barrier to why more people aren't involved. And I think also, you know, we're talking about the stories we tell, but I think something that was really apparent to us is the stories that we don't tell. And I think, you know, if we include and normalise a lot of wider issues that involve uh, more people, I think more people would be interested. Even looking, I mean, we talked about countries in the global south and diaspora, but even if you look at this country... Social justice and climate change are so completely interlinked that quite often what we view as a social justice story is also a climate change story. The imagery and the kind of facts that we associate with climate change tend to be about ice melting, rising sea levels, and these are big things that are hard to make very personal stories about. But actually there are plenty of personal stories that are affected by these things. What every writer is challenged with is how do I make this personal to the reader? Um, how do I get the reader to go, oh yeah, that moment where they relate. I think there is a major challenge in getting some of these facts across. And it, uh, we have an advantage as writers, because we can lie. Um, scientists can't lie. And this is why they keep getting caught, because scientists have to, <laughs> scientists have to give caveats for everything they say. So, well, we think it could be 1.2 degrees, but it could be as much as 1.4. And you can imagine, well, if you're the expert and you don't know, how are we supposed to be concerned about this? So writers can say, look, it's going to get bad. We need to do something about it. I'm going to make a disaster movie. Um, there's going to be loads of people dying. And so we can kind of exaggerate, we can use emphasis where, where a scientist can't because they're trapped by fact. They have to be as accurate as they can because they know a whole other scientist is going to go, hang on a second now, you know, we're peer reviewing you now and you're, I'm telling you, you get this wrong, your career is over. Um, so we can, we can lie and we can exaggerate and we can, we can use dramatic effect, um, but we're not experts. So it's finding the balance. I think... These, thing, these big issues, climate change or species extinction, or these things we're sort of wrestling with, or social justice, they're kind of filtering out quietly, and we're probably not noticing it so much. So we might be saying, what, where are the big, big hitters of art and literature? You know, why aren't they taking a stand on this? I don't think they need to, because it will reach them eventually, and in the meantime, everyone else is being influenced by these things. I think probably it's a much quieter process. Um, rather than being a big celebrity issue. Um, I think that's, that's not necessarily a good thing. I just wanted to ask you about working with young people. I don't know how many of you do, but whether or not um, for them growing up, whether or not for the younger people they feel it is a big issue or whether they feel there are, 
there are other things that are more important to them, whether it's already part of their understanding of the world because they would have been brought up, brought up on it. Certainly, I've, I've worked with young people who have been incredibly knowledgeable and, and quite scared and petrified, and, and on the other hand, they've, they've been trying to get involved in activism and actively changing. Um, and I suppose related to that last question is, is the, you know, the, the climate that we're living in, it, it's, it's, it's the political climate is not going to promote um, solutions. It's, it's, going to, it's run by fear, and fear drives consumerism and, and everything else. So I think um, that that's a broader narrative that they're in. So it's, it's about relating to them on their level and, and what they're experiencing in everyday life. And, and maybe if, if they're not making those connections with the, you know, from their own lives, we can maybe introduce how it relates to bigger pictures and bigger global scenarios. If you make greening something that can promote greening as a vocational po possibility, because they are scared, you're right, the scared is a, is a big thing. They, f they feel there's a conspiracy against them, the way education's being cut. You know, it's, it's very, very hard for them to even think about prospects and a future, but to, for them to be engaged with the future, I think that's a way that they can be, is to think about how you can give them jobs that mean and training that's hands-on, you know, take everything out of celebrity culture, take all the focus off of um, technology and IT. I mean, that's important, obviously, but it's definitely about getting back to grips with the land and um, alternative economies through doing that, because that's, that's what's, what's concerning them right now, really, is, is, is how they're going to make money after they've left school. I feel, I feel really lucky to work with young people, and as I totally said, they're, they're so varied uh, in what their, pre, uh, their concerns are and worries are. Um, but I think there's been a, a general shift, and it was, it was since the kind of economic crash in 2008. It's around the kind of more the day-to-day, -day, and climate change doesn't feel like the day-to-day -day in the same way as, as paying rent and bills and how am I going to get a job, and oh, I've got A-levels and qualifications, oh, every, no, I can't afford to go to university, what am I going to do? They're, they're the pressing concerns that you have to make now, whereas climate change feels like, oh, other people are doing that. That's, that's bigger. That's not me right now. <laughs> climate change as a concept is still very theoretical, and it does, say, mm. it does feel like a distant future. But they are very definitely understanding sustainability. Mm. Um, and that's a much more basic principle. And it's one that you, you, don't, you don't have to think about for very long before you realise, well, we're burning, we're burning something that, take, that took millions of years to make and we can't replace it and our entire economy our civilization is based on this thing that's going to run out so they get this kind of stuff and i think they're they're growing up with this as part of their background as part of their you know this is normal for them now to the point where businesses now when they're getting their new their kind of hot new recruits in one of the selling points for these big companies is because the the young Turks want to know, what are you doing about sustainability? This is actually now becoming an issue for business mm. because the really key people, the smart people, want to know what the company is doing before they join. I, I, have some, I just feel a little bit uncomfortable talking about young people like they're different mm. beings. <laughs> young people. Um, <laughs> and I don't mean this in a critical way, but often young people are quite, um, are quite selfish in their outlook and, uh, on the world because that's just what it's like when you're young as well. Growing up is tough. Uh, it is, yeah, and you and you don't really think about what things mean for other people often because you have to learn that. It's like something we learn as we get older. The way in which we encourage as a society young people to live their lives in terms of consuming things and um, being engaged with the media and having phones and like every young person's running around with the even though they might be concerned about climate change, they're running around with some precious metals in their pocket as well at the same time. So it's and that's because they want to be cool with their friends or to do everything that everyone else is doing and they're born into it mm. and they learn from it how to be so what we have to be responsible so i'm saying it's a team effort we have to work with them that yolo you only live once the culture of yolo is because they're like well you know we're all going to die anyway so what's mm. the point it's a two-way street i think we are strapline is energizing the creative response to climate change. If you burrow down a few layers, um, I think we're a campaigning organization, mm -hmm. a sort of we're activists by proxy, um, and we'd like the world to be a different place. And I just wonder if anyone's how comfortable you feel with that and how you feel stories play a role, if any, in helping to change the way the world is. I think one of the things that stories can do that maybe the facts might not, and that's to give hope. 
Um, because we have to have hope if we're going to be positive and do something about it. And I mean, for a start, we changed our weather by accident. That's how powerful we are. Um, we just, we mucked up and we changed our climate. Um, can you imagine what we did if we, if we put our minds to it? <laughs> Decided, <laughs> let's change it back. Um, the problem is we, are, we love to think that we're logical and we're not. We are emotional creatures. We are driven by emotion. We are driven by animal instincts. And stories engage that better than facts do. I think there's something about empathy and community as well and kind of this, this narrative around climate change that if we don't work together, we are pretty screwed and working against this kind of individualism and this whole social justice issue and that, well, you might be all right now, but there are people currently who are affected by climate change. And for me, story is about enabling someone to step out of their world into another world and to, to, to emotionally engage with that. And if you're stuck within, you know, the, the circles that have created these problems in the first place, then how much of a change can we actually anticipate? It's actually got to be new thinking and a diverse range of people. That is actually what's going to change things. And for that, we need a new language. For that, we need artists. The thing about stories as well is that um, they do allow us to enter different dimensions. And it flexes a muscle, our imagination. Um, which I think, um, just if you go through the education system, you know, it's like you, you don't imagine, you, you just do as you're told. We need to always have stories because they are a part of our humanity. Grayson Perry was asked what's the role of art and he said something like, um, artists don't, don't have a role, um, they notice things. That's their role is to notice things. They could notice the way the light falls on an apple or they could notice how their government's oppressing them. Depends on the temperament of the artist. And I think talking about, I always feel a bit uneasy about this idea of the role of storytellers, like you have a job that you're kind of signed up to. Yeah. I don't think storytellers do have a job, but we live in stories and we are stories, like you said. And one of the most important things I think we can do as storytellers is recognise that the story that we hear at the moment is a story. The, the narrative that humans are in control of everything can change the weather like that when they want. Um, that we have this kind of omnipotent power, that's only a certain way of interpreting events and it's not the only way of doing it. Thank you. Um, thank all of you very much for an incredible evening. Thank you as well.